issued on the parking order as well as uh, tender forms. Uh, as well as uh, blank forms uh, and pens in case anyone has any comments or questions that you'd prefer to leave in writing. Uh, let me start by welcoming uh, each of you for coming to join us for this evening's public information meeting on a quiet zone investigation. My name is Eli Cooper. I'm the city's transportation program manager. And with me here this evening, I do have uh, our project team, uh, consultants who are much more versed and experienced in quiet zones than I, and uh, Andy Melke and uh, Christopher Ryan will be uh, walking us through a set of slides, and uh, the three of us uh, will be trying to address, and I say trying because I'm not sure we'll have all the answers uh, here this evening. If you have specific answers about quiet zones, those uh, are the guys that know about it, so those questions could be answers. Uh, where we're going, uh, you'll hear during the presentation that there's a series of steps in the process, 
and that I, as the city's uh, project lead, uh, will be facilitating that effort as we move forward. And there will be a number of uh, choices to be made, decisions to be made uh, as we move forward. So you really don't want to hear too much from me. Let me uh, turn it over to Andy, and uh, I'm uh, likely to be able to speak with you again when questions come uh, at, after the presentation. With no further ado, Mr. Melge. Good evening. Uh, as Eli mentioned, my name is Andy Melke. I'm a principal with SRF Consulting Group. Uh, it is uh, our pleasure to, uh, to be with you here tonight and, and to be working on this project assisting the city of Ann Arbor as they investigate the, the feasibility uh, for a train whistle quiet zone here. Uh, we went out and, and looked at all the crossings today that are included. Uh, there's a total of 19 that are shown on this map. We actually went and looked at two additional crossings to the north uh, following uh, these, these 19, uh, which included uh, Traver and Duvar, Duvarn. Um, but essentially the quiet zone runs from State Street on the, on the south end all the way up to, um, to uh, Burton Drive on the north end. And a quiet zone uh, could, could contain all of these crossings. It could contain a portion of these crossings or, or some mixture thereof. It has to con be a continuous zone of crossings and things. But uh, this is the uh, project study limits, essentially, that we had looked at. A little background for you on train whistle quiet zones. This all started back in 1994 when uh, Congress essentially enabled uh, quiet zones to be uh, allowed and some cities uh, took it upon themselves and created ordinances and things, local ordinances, to uh, ban and, and limit uh, train whistles from being sounded. They took about 10 years or so and, and solicited input from communities and residents and other professional experts and things. And then in 2005, they enacted the, uh, the quiet zone rule and this went into effect. And that rule again more or less governs and sets the process for how quiet zones uh, go into effect and, and what improvements need to be made. So simply put, what does a quiet zone do? Um, a quiet zone uh, eliminates the routine sounding of horns, and I want to stress that word routine. Um, if a quiet zone were to be implemented here in Ann Arbor, it doesn't mean that you'll never hear a, a train horn again. It just means that the routine sounding of horns at every crossing would cease. Uh, trains are required to sound their horns four times per crossing. It's a regulated sequence that is too long, two shorts, a long, and a, and a short. So there's essentially four horn blasts per crossing. So uh, there's quite a few horn blasts for just one train that come through uh, this corridor here in Ann Arbor. Um, horns can still sound their horns, though. Trains can still sound their horns if there's any construction work that's going on, if there's a potential danger or threat, uh, such as pedestrians that are near the crossing. Uh, there might even be a stray dog or a, a deer or some other type of animal that they could sound their horn. And it, it will still allow train horns to be sounded in a yard operation. So as trains are backing up and moving forward and things, um, hooking up cars and things, they can still sound their horn for those types of operations. That's a requirement, again, by the feds, not part of the quiet zone rule. So to talk a little bit more on the specifics of, of the quiet zone, I'm going to hand it over to Chris Ryan. So thank you, Andy. So Andy provided some great background information on where the rule came from, what it does, what it does not do. My role for this middle section of the presentation will be to kind of walk you through what is required. What does the city actually have to do to implement a quiet zone? And we like to boil it down to essentially a, a two-step process. The first step is making sure that every crossing that is in the proposed quiet zone needs to meet the minimum requirements. And so the minimum requirements are listed up here. The first bullet is, you know, the quiet zone must be at least half a mile long. This is a very long corridor. We easily meet that requirement. Um, it also needs to include all crossings within the quiet zone limits. There's not a way to sort of... Uh, hopscotch your way across a couple of crossings that are more difficult. If you start at one crossing and end at another, everything in between needs to be included in the quiet zone. More importantly, all of the public crossings need to be equipped with gates, flashing lights, constant warning time detection, or CWT, it's a type of train detection system, and power at indicators at the signal cabinets. This is, it's very uh, important that every single public crossing has these improvements. This is a, uh, a table showing the current crossing conditions for the crossings in Ann Arbor, the 19. It's important to note that 
Um, there are quite a few that have gates, even some that have CWT, but there are no current crossings in, our, in, in Ann Arbor that have uh, gates, flashing lights, and CWT. With the exception of uh, Duvarin up to the north, um, that is not, not included on this table, that is equipped with all of the minimum requirements. So what that means is that when the city is looking at how can we implement a quiet zone, we need to first look at what does it take, what are the costs to upgrade each of these crossings to meet those, and then move on to uh, step two, which is a quiet zone risk analysis. So the FRA looks at the quiet zone essentially, you know, once you're, you're meeting those minimum requirements, it's a numbers game. The FRA assumes that it, you, if you start at a certain risk level, which I'll get into here in a little bit, um, and you take away the, the sounding of the horns, that will increase the risk. So the FRA's formula takes into account highway volumes, uh, train volumes, train speeds, the skew of the roadway. Is it a perpendicular crossing or is it more heavily skewed than that? And it takes all of those factors into its formula and outputs a number, a, a risk index that then we use for our final calculations to determine whether or not a quiet zone is viable. Um, there's a lot of acronyms on this board, but the, the key ones to keep in mind are the QZRI, which stands for Quiet Zone Risk Index, um, the Risk Index with Horns, RIHW, and the NSRT, which is the Nationwide Significant Risk Threshold. And I'll try to boil it down to make this under, understandable. There's a lot of um, terminology and, and acronyms um, included on this slide. Essentially, the NSRT is the National Average Risk for all crossings in the United States that are equipped with gates and flashing lights. It's sort of a, a national bar um, that is a threshold and one way to get a, a quiet zone. The risk index with horns, the RAHW, that is essentially the current risk index now with the horn sounding under the current conditions. The baseline QZRI, that is what the quiet zone risk index is once you take away that horn sounding. It will increase by 66.8% according to the FRA's model. And then the final QZRI, that is your risk index after you've added additional safety improvements, such as medians or, or other safety measures that lower your risk, uh, increase the safety. I've got a, an example here to kind of walk through what this can look like. This is an example of a quiet zone we worked on uh, that had just three crossings. You can see each crossing has a different risk level. Some are higher, some are lower. The blue line there is representing the average for the entire corridor as a whole. The dotted line is representing that national average. When you take away the sounding of the horn, based on the FRA's model, all of the risks will go up. So now the current risk in the corridor is this red line. So for us to qualify for a quiet zone, what we need to do is add improvements such that that red line is below either the blue line or the dotted line. In this example, we were able to put, um, put into place um, safety measures that reduced the risk by 80% at every crossing. And you can see that lowers it down to the green bar, which is lower than the blue, and therefore we would qualify. One thing I want to highlight, though, is that it is often the case that it's not possible to put a full safety improvement at every crossing. In some cases, you might have an instance where, say, for 3rd Street and 5th Street, we are able to put that improvement into place. But for 12th Street here, there's nothing that works. There's issues that prevent us from implementing a safety measure. What's important to note here is that even though for 12th Street, the risk is higher and remains higher in the after condition, the average for the corridor, that green line, is still below the thresholds that we need to meet to qualify for quiet zone implementation. So as we put together our improvement scenarios for Ann Arbor, we'll be looking at a variety of scenarios, um, trying to, to mix and match different improvements at different crossings to get the numbers to work out to qualify for a, a quiet zone. So I've been talking about safety measures that we can install to lower that risk. The FRA has pre-approved a number of safety measures, the most common of which are probably medians and channelization devices. Medians are, as I'm sure you're familiar, the, 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 on the center of the road. They are installed on the approach to the gate, and what they do is they prevent a driver from circumventing the gate, driving around it, and going through the crossing. Uh, they are ideally are 60 to 100 feet in advance of the crossing, and they need to be at least six inches high, but other than that, um, there are no other requirements for those. Four quadrant vehicle gates. These are, instead of just the entry gate, you have uh, an exit gate as well on both sides, both approaches, so it fully closes off the crossing um, to prevent people from going through. 
closure is listed here as an option. Obviously, closures have more impact than just on the risk reduction. They have impacts to traffic, to uh, the ability to navigate the city. So we don't look at closures lightly, but they are a potential improvement that we do want to keep on the table to at least discuss what are the, the pros and cons, advantages, disadvantages of those. Um, One-way street is sometimes an, sorry? Yes, so the question is what, what is included in the closure, and I think it's important to specify this. It, it would be a closure of the street, both to ve vehicles and pedestrians, a full closure. So it would be impactful. So I don't want to scare anybody with the word, with the C word here. Um, One-way streets are sometimes used. There are a couple one-way streets in Ann Arbor, but they are being converted to two-way. So in this case, they would not be something that is, is necessarily viable. Um, wayside horns, finally, is the last um, item here. And I will talk more about wayside horns after I show you a couple of examples of what we mean by these different safety improvements. So here's an example of four quadrant gates. You can see there's the normal entry gates paired with exit gates on each side. I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Um, the, gates, the entry gates go down and they are timed such that um, not every gate goes down at the same time. The entry gates go down to make sure the cars are not trapped on the track. They can leave and then the exit gates go down. The advantage to these is that they have very few impacts generally to the surrounding um, roadway accesses, business accesses. The disadvantage is the cost is substantially higher than some of the other improvement options. So we'll be balancing that cost and benefit as we look at our different options. Non-traversable medians. This is an example of a um, a rather narrow median, actually, but it highlights uh, that I believe this is a two-foot wide median leading up to uh, gates. And so what it does, like I, I mentioned, is prevent vehicles from driving around the gate um, and going through the crossing. Channelization devices are, they function similar to how a, a non-traversable median functions by preventing that movement. And these are a good option in cases where you have a very narrow roadway where there just isn't sufficient roadway width to fit in a median. These are narrow strips of delineator paddles that are essentially bolted down to the roadway. And in some instances, these might be a preferred option over medians, um, depending on the roadway conditions. Crossing closure, as I mentioned, it is intended to be a full closure, both to vehicles and pedestrians. This kind of shows the range of the simple version, um, quick and cheap on the left, versus the more landscaped, polished version on the right. Alternative safety measures, this is, um, in some cases, I mentioned that the, the, the medians and the delineators, they should be at least 60 feet long, ideally 100 feet long. In many cases, there is a commercial driveway or a roadway access that prevents them from being that long. In those cases, the FRA does allow the implementation of shorter medians. Um, generally, we don't like to go lower than 15 feet, but um, you can put in shorter medians. You get a slightly lower risk reduction, but it does give you some risk reduction. Finally, wayside horns are an, a topic that I know has come up a couple times in some of the, uh, the emails that I, I've been seeing in regards to the quiet zone. The purpose of a wayside horn is to act as a one-for-one -one replacement of the train horn. So instead of the horn sounding, there is uh, uh, the horn sounding from a train, that is, there is this wayside horn, which is that little device on the right-hand side that looks like um, a small horn. And that the idea is that it's a slightly less intense uh, blast that is directed down the street at a smaller area. The issue with these and the difficulty is that it still requires the minimum signal upgrades, so the, it is still quite a costly option to implement. Um, and our experience working with other communities has been that they are typically not satisfied with them. Um, it's a lot of money to spend to end up with a, um, you know, replacing one horn with a slightly less loud horn. So. In general, we advise against them, but they are an option on the table. And so today, um, we held our diagnostic meeting, as Andy mentioned. This is a picture of us um, out there in the field. And the purpose of the diagnostic meeting is to get everybody, um, the FRA, the city, Michigan DOT, all at the same table to discuss, you know, what are these different options. We look at the crossing, we identify how can we actually fit in these gate system upgrades, and then once we've hit that first step, how, what are the different options? Can we do medians here? Can we close it? Is that an option? Um, what are the, laying everything out on the table to make sure we identify the issues. And for this, I'm gonna pass it back to Andy to uh, close out here with some of the, once we've gone through this, what are some of the next steps? 
All right, so the process here is laid out for implementing a quiet zone, and, and really that diagnostic meeting is, is really the first step because it's, it's that information gathering. As Chris showed on the previous slide, we had a lot of experts uh, here in, in the community today, uh, those from the FRA, the railroad, uh, the Michigan DOT, ourselves, uh, what have you, looking at each of the crossings to try to come up with a list of what those crossing improvements would be. Uh, that'll be our next step as we move forward in the weeks to come here, is determining what types of improvements work and fit at each crossing, coming up with different scenarios and packaging those all up. If the city decides to move forward, and, and I want to reiterate, if the city decides to move forward, the first official step in the quiet zone process with the FRA is to file a notice of intent. That notice, more or less, is just a, a notice of, a, to the railroad, the FRA, Michigan DOT, what have you, that the city intends to pursue a quiet zone. Lays out and identifies what potential improvements might be at what specific crossings uh, that those would be occurring at. Then there is a, a quiet zone application. It may be necessary, again, determining, depending on what type of crossing improvements are, uh, are proposed, if we use some of those uh, improvements that are not pre-approved by the FRA, we would have to file this quiet zone application. Uh, it's not a huge step in the process. Uh, we filed uh, quite a few of those. We've never had one rejected. The issue is that it adds more time to the, the process in doing that. There's about a nine to 12 month um, delay in terms of doing an application process if one of those uh, is necessary. Uh, the next step here, step five, would be the construction and installation of crossing improvements. That's actually where um, design plans would be developed. People would go out, install uh, the lights, gates, and constant warning time detection at each of the crossings, as well as whatever roadway improvements would be necessary uh, at each of the crossings. Once that's all concluded, there'd be a final walkthrough and inspection meeting to make sure that everything is, uh, has been constructed and improved as the plan said they should be. And then finally, once that is done and, and everybody has agreed that uh, things are done the way they should, we would file a notice of establishment. Once that notice of establishment is submitted, the railroads would have 21 days to then cease the routine sounding of horns, and that would be the final step in the process. This whole process, though, um, as mentioned here, you know, generally takes one to two years. Depending on the, the significance of the improvements, it could even take longer. You know, you could be looking at a two to three or, or maybe even longer process based on the, the gate installation. Could you describe the early steps, step one, step two, um, when you talk about a year or two, how much time do you anticipate or would you anticipate a local community from once we get the results from the diagnostic and you know, you have a series of alternatives to go through a, a full public process uh, to make sure that uh, we have the Sure, great, great question, Eli, and just for, so everybody could uh, hear his question, asking a little bit about the process and the schedule time frame from here we are at the diagnostic meeting today to then determining the necessary crossing improvements and what that would take. Uh, I would ballpark it at roughly three months or so. Um, we'll be, you know, reviewing the, the recommendations from the diagnostic team, the, the list of improvements and things, developing scenarios. We'll be in close coordination with yourself and other staff members, you know, looking to get input and in things and, and packaging up these different crossing improvements, coming up with different scenarios. Uh, for instance, you know, one scenario might be uh, an improvement at every crossing, and, and that could be a, a more uh, robust scenario that might have a higher cost uh, to it. We might have another scenario that um, looks on the other side of the spectrum in terms of what's the, you know, minimalist approach to implementing a quiet zone that might be more cost effective. And then there might be a couple scenarios in, in the middle that look at whether or not we include a closure or some other types of crossing scenarios. Uh, maybe it's just a limited number of crossings. So we'll be kind of working through those different scenarios, you know, um, coordination with city staff and things to uh, develop those scenarios over the next several months. Yes, ma'am. Sure, sure. So the, the question is, in uh, regards to the application process and whether or not um, that would be required and what kind of ASM. So um, as Chris mentioned with medians or channelization devices, um, you, we want to have at least a 100-foot median on each side of the tracks, so that median in the, in the center of the roadway, 
if uh, we have a reduced length median, say we can only fit a 50 foot median in there, that then would tra that would be considered an ASM, an alternative safety measure that would then trigger an application to be used. Um, this would, you know, we would develop that scenario in the report, and if the city chose to move forward with that type of a scenario, That's then the what's that? Right, we would submit the notice of intent that has a 60-day review period with it, and then our next step would be this application that we would have to submit, and, and that would have roughly about a nine-month review period for it. So, following up on that question, suppose we submit an application to the FRA with some ASMs in it. Mm -hmm. Is it a simple scoring methodology that they use, or is there subjective review of these different criteria? Yeah, great, great question. Um, essentially, is it, a, is it an objective approach based on uh, calculations and, and numbers, or is, it a, is there some subjectivity? And it is an objective um, approach to that. It's a prorated risk reduction, essentially. Um, a full-length median gets you an 80% risk reduction at a crossing. If you were only getting half of that, and say you put one on one side and nothing on the other, you would then get a 40% risk reduction. Uh, we have to, you know, we develop a spreadsheet basically that we use to submit this and, and moving forward, and, and those numbers are then reviewed by the Federal Railroad Administration. And why does that take nine months? Yeah, it, is this like a stupid question? No, 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 no. It, it, we, we, Well, well put, um, you know, why does it take so long? Uh, they have excellent staff, and, and we met with uh, one of their finest today, uh, the regional rep who, who serves Michigan is top notch. Um, she, you know, would endorse the application, and yep, everything looks solid, and, and fire it away and go. It just, it goes to Washington, to uh, Washington, D.C., and it's, or it's answered in the order it's received, essentially. So there's a stack of them, and, and they run through it. I'm just going to go to the question in the back here. She's had her hand up. Yep, great question. Um, what would be the limits, the termini essentially for the quiet zone? And we will look at different uh, combinations of crossings. They have to be consecutive crossings, but, um, but we would look at different scenarios that would um, maybe include all of them and maybe include a portion of them based on uh, what types of risk reduction and things are possible. So, yes, ma'am. Yeah, Well, the, the scenario that Chris showed you with the bar charts w was actually a different quiet zone. It was not here in Ann Arbor, uh, if, if that's where you're drawing that conclusion from. Uh, it was just to demonstrate how the risk calculation works, and, and maybe just to clarify and reiterate that again if there's any, any confusion amongst folks. Basically, there's a certain amount of risk today with the horn sounded, and when we take that risk away, the, horn go, the, the risk goes up. And then we make crossing improvements at one crossing at a time, essentially, to lower that risk to essentially get below the risk that there is today. Once we get below that risk or the national average, that's when you're then eligible to qualify for a quiet zone. So he was just using a, a simple three crossing scenario that we had, had done recently. Not, not, yeah, the question is, is, is would, under any scenario, would the risk be less than it is right now? Not necessarily if, it could, it could, it could be, Abs absolutely, it could be. You know, the installation of lights, gates, constant warning time, power out indicators is going to bring a significant risk reduction as well to the crossing, which currently does not exist today. However, um, take, removing the horn then introduces, you know, a new risk and then we'd have to make crossing improvements to get it down below those thresholds. So it, it, it you know, that, that's where this analysis process really has to run its course to look at the different scenarios in terms of what's eligible and could qualify. It's a good question though, and I, I appreciate you asking that. Um, I, I do have one more slide and then we'll, we'll open the floor to any other questions. Um, 
we've had the, 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 the pleasure of working on roughly 60 quiet zones throughout the country. And it, it seems like every one of them kind of comes down to uh, this simple graphic that we developed years ago, but it kind of highlights the, the tug of war maybe that communities deal with throughout the country that, that are investigating and evaluating quiet zones. And it really is the balancing act between safety, cost, and quality of life. Simply put, those, those three um, those are three of the reasons why communities oftentimes what they wrestle with in determining whether or not to proceed with a quiet zone. Uh, I'm sure many of you are, are, you know, maybe interested in pursuing a quiet zone to eliminate the routine sounding of horns and increase the quality of life. Um, the city has a, a, a financial responsibility to you uh, to do that in a cost-effective manner and balancing that cost. And probably most importantly, there's a safety component to that. And, and that's where you know, the railroad looks at it first and foremost from a safety standpoint. The Michigan DOT looks at it from a safety standpoint. The FRA is here to ensure that safety is adhered to in all situations. And so it's that, it's that balancing act. And, and this, uh, this is just meant to illustrate you know, kind of where that is. And you can apply it to any combination of crossings as a zone or even your own crossing that's, that's close to your home or work or whatever the case might be in terms of what's you know, applicable, what's necessary, and what would be the right thing to do, and, and the right thing in quotes, of course. So um, with that, we'll open the floor to any questions. I'll, I can leave that up to, to show. Uh, I see a number of hands. I guess, Eli, I'll turn it back to you first. Appreciate that. Thank you, Andy. I uh, just wanted to take a, a moment or two. Uh, again, for those of you who have arrived late, uh, we do have a sign-in sheet, and we, uh, if you'd like uh, future communication from the city project team, please leave us your email, and we'll make sure that you're on our list. I uh, also would like to acknowledge a couple of folks who are in the room. We have uh, uh, Council Member uh, Smith uh, from the Fifth Ward, I believe, mm -hmm. and then also from MDOT Office of Rail, we have Chris Fundel, uh, who was out uh, in the field with us today. and. Uh, came back uh, to participate in this evening's uh, public information meeting. Uh, so as you've seen from the presentation, this is uh, a process that's underway. Uh, we've completed the first step, at least the data collection piece. Uh, the project team is going to take that and go back into their office and uh, work through the various information that they've collected, uh, bring it back to us. and. As we begin to process that information, we'll be bringing it back to the community in a variety of forms. And uh, we haven't specifically laid out uh, when are we going to go to the Transportation Commission, what's the role of the, that commission and the council, uh, but there will be uh, serious discussions of all the factors related to the types of safety measures uh, and the balancing that this slide speaks to. Uh, which is how do we achieve s safety at a reasonable cost to increase or provide the highest quality of life. And so that's what our charge is as staff is to uh, uh, convene and conduct this exercise. And uh, obviously everything we do uh, revolves around and involves you as uh, the uh, community, the citizens, uh, the interested parties, and we look forward to questions that you might have of us here this evening. And again, I'll keep pointing to the experts are in town um, I'm available, uh, pick up the phone, send me an email anytime. I'd be happy to uh, coordinate with you, but really take the advantage of the expertise we have on the specific technical elements of a quiet zone. Uh, with that, please. One of the things, because as I mentioned earlier on, the, the meeting is being taped, so we'll repeat the key elements of the question as we answer them. Uh, so I apologize uh, for being redundant. Uh, but with regard to the first question, uh, first part of the question I could answer is what uh, is the current phase of work? What was the uh, cost and scope? So the overall city council approval included a contract with uh, SRF uh, and some uh, resources for staff time under $35,000 all combined. Uh, and uh, that work is funding uh, to completion uh, the diagnostic survey, the consideration of alternatives and recommendations that we will receive. 
with regard to their experience on typical crossing costs, I'll uh, step aside and let the expert speak. So good, good question on regards to cost. Just to install um, what I'll call the prerequisite uh, requirements, the gates, flashing lights, constant warning time, power out indicators, that's the prerequisite that's required to even be eligible for a quiet zone. Rough cost, um, average crossing that the railroad has provided us is about $250,000 per crossing. Additional imp roadway improvements, uh, crossing improvements, um, again, it ranges. The channelization devices are relatively inexpensive. Those can be done for a couple of thousand dollars. You know, one of the things that, that we wrestle with in, in that recommendation is it becomes somewhat of a maintenance issue. Um, as, as the picture indicated, if you recall, kind of the paddles that were, were bolted onto the roadway. Uh, when it snows and a snowplow goes through, and if a snowplow hooks one of those and and breaks it off or what have you, that needs to be replaced. Otherwise, the quiet zone is non-compliant. So you need to kind of have a running stock of those to uh, keep those handy for replacement. Concrete medians, uh, those range in, in cost in terms of what the significance of the project is. If you're just putting a concrete median down an existing roadway and, and milling it in, essentially, uh, it could be $30,000. If you've got to do any roadway widening or something, you start getting into you know, six figures perhaps. Um, it kind of depends on the project if right away is needed. A lot of variables there, of course. Um, crossing closures. Closures you might actually make some money on, uh, believe it or not. Um, there are programs in place that, that will pay the city for crossing closures. You have to do some street enhancements and things to, to seal off the corridor, the, the roadway. Um, and depending on how elaborate you want to go in terms of, you know, you can just put jersey barrier, concrete barriers up. Uh, relatively cheap. It's not very aesthetically pleasing, but uh, it's functional. Or you could do some, you know, more increased landscaping and other types of things to beautify the crossing. Uh, and then there's four quadrant gates, three quadrant gates where basically you're adding an exit gate. Those get in to be about three quarters of a million dollars per crossing. So it's a very complex and sophisticated system. I apologize for the long answer, but I wanted to be thorough and complete or as, as much as I could. Thank you. Thank you. So just following up on that, you said, you know, Great question, and, and essentially it's, is the improvement done by the railroad or done by the city? And it really is a two-part um, scenario improvement. The railroad is responsible for work on, on their right-of-way, essentially, so when we're talking about lights and gates and the installation of lights and gates, that is in their right-of-way, and they would be responsible for that work. And I want to be clear here, they would be responsible, but because this is a city-initiated project, the city would pay for it but they would perform the work and the installation and things and just hand, hand the city the receipt, essentially, for the cost of services and, and maturity. Maintenance, responsibility of the railroad? Um, that, that is a negotiable item. Um, most, most situations, um, the installation of gates, just two quadrant gates, would be on the railroad's responsibility. Um, as you start looking at more complex systems of three and four quadrant gates, uh, then, you, then you might bear some of that cost and things. The city would be responsible for the design and construction of roadway improvements, though. So in addition to paying for those, the city would lead that effort because it's city right away in terms of construction on a street. Point of clarification. Yeah. Uh, in the state of Michigan, uh, road authorities are responsible for 50% of the maintenance costs for all active warning devices by law. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chris. Right, thank you. Yeah. In the state of Michigan, road authorities are responsible for 50% of the federal requirement for them to clean, test, inspect on a monthly, quarterly, semi-annual, and annual basis to ensure they're working properly for the motoring public. They incur a substantial cost for that, and our laws allow the uh, railroads to be reimbursed by the railroads for 50% of their cost on that. Maybe just to reiterate that, because it is a key point, and just for our viewers at home, um, what, what he had mentioned was that the city would be responsible for 50% of the railroad uh, maintenance costs, essentially, for gate installation and things moving forward. So, yes, sir. Uh, appreciate you having this program. Uh, the emphasis, understandably, has been on safety. But I'm 
wondering to what extent the public health issue is being considered. There's increasing awareness that um, noise is a public health hazard. Mm -hmm. Increased blood pressure, pressure, cardiovascular problems, etc. Is and the damage that is caused by that. Mm -hmm. Is that being taken into account by, by this effort? Sure. I, I'll I'll go first. Um, Eli, feel free to jump in as as you see fit here. Um, in my opinion, yes, it is. You know, I'm I'm well aware of the noise pollution issues, and having worked in quiet zones for almost 15 years now, um, seeing that myself, I had a community once that thought I was kind of the judge and jury of, of determining whether or not they should get a quiet zone and they had me stay right downtown in the, in the crossing so that I could experience it and I, I, I knew myself uh, what the impacts were and things but I'm aware of the, the severity and the seriousness of that. Um, unfortunately I guess from, from my perspective it's hard to quantify that in terms of what the cost and value is. I'm sure um, you know, a, a medical professional could maybe uh, do a calculation. We have not gone to that length yet in, in our process uh, for doing that, but, but it is something to consider in terms of, you know, physical health, mental health, the ability to sleep through the night or, or even just conduct business. Um, you know, economic development is a big driver for this as well, aside from, I don't want to detract from your question, but aside from uh, health conditions, you know, the economic impacts of, of doing a quiet zone in terms of making it a desirable place to live and work and play um, are important as well. So, Eli, anything you want to mention or more? Well, um, thank you, Andy. And, and, and I don't have a lot to, answer, uh, to add to the answer. Um, the primary uh, criterion that we need to satisfy are the federal quiet zone regulations. And to the extent that there's science that supports the, the criterion that the Federal Railroad Administration has selected, uh, that you know, the, the type of improvements that will be recommended will satisfy those criterion. More specifically to the human health measures, that's something that we're going to have to take a look at where we are relative to uh, conformity with the FRA regulations and, and how much additional information, more local information that we would want to uh, try to collect and assess as uh, we make decisions more locally. Because again, the, the first criterion is to conduct the investigations and determine that uh, with the improvements that we could be compliant with the federal uh, requirements for the establishment of this quiet zone. But keep in mind that there are costs that will have to be weighed, measured, and balanced with not only the benefits to safety, but the community value benefits. And that's something that uh, we'll need to explore in greater detail uh, when we get to that stage. So the, the question was that you hear the horn when there's a, a, a situation on the track itself, a person on a bridge or thereabouts. Right, and, and so uh, I'm repeating the question to the extent so that the folks that uh, can't hear you asking the question. Uh, there was a, a slide early on in the presentation that indicated that uh, although a quiet zone will uh, uh, prevent the routine sounding of horn, uh, it will not eliminate all train horns. So those types of specific conditions uh, as well as uh, yard movements. Uh, the one thing that I don't, I don't think might have been said during the presentation uh, is that there in fact is uh, a siding uh, located between State Street and Hoover and that the uh, Ann Arbor Railroad does actually maneuver uh, equipment in that area so they are from time to time sounding the horn to alert uh, the other rail uh, employees and those would continue whenever they would have equipment that would be being uh, transacted in that uh, siding area which again is south of Hoover and to the, I guess I'll describe it as west of State Street. Go ahead, please. So I, I live within uh, the distance. I have three crossings probably within three to 400 feet of my house. And I've lived there since 1973. And back then, there were sometimes five, six trains a day. And, that, and then the procession, and then there were hardly any trains been picking up. Uh, I was wondering how long 
so uh, the question is, how long has the Quiet Zone program been on the books? And I think what we heard as part of the earlier part of the presentation is the FRA adopted guidelines in 2005, and that in the city of Ann Arbor, it's been a recent uh, direction that I have received in order to begin the process, and we brought that information back to council who authorized the contract that we've entered with SRF Consulting. So we've been at this for a few months now, uh, and, and that's in response to uh, concerns that have arisen through the community uh, and that we are trying to be responsive by uh, engaging with the experts, uh, undertaking the appropriate analysis, and reporting back uh, with what uh, the various uh, costs and benefits are for advancing a program forward. Right. So, so again, uh, in restating what I'm hearing in terms of your question is what is the relationship between the railroad and its operations and the necessity and volume of, of train horn soundings. And uh, what I can say in the uh, 13 and a half, 14 years I've been with the city, I've had this issue arise from time to time. And I have anecdotally heard from folks at the uh, um, Ann Arbor Railroad Company, uh, different staff uh, sometimes uh, operate differently, but all of their operators are required to comply with the federal regulation. So uh, I recall about six years ago there was an issue in terms of the volume of the horn, and the railroad company provided us the testing results of when their equipment was tested, and I'm sure uh, Chris could probably give you more detail from MDOT's perspective of how that horn testing is done and what the compliance factors are. Generally speaking, the WATCO, which is the parent railroad and the, uh, uh, the primary um, um, executive officer uh, of the railroad company was out there with us today. And so, uh, I, although I understand and appreciate, the fact is what we heard is four soundings per crossing, trains are moving at uh, around 10 to 15 miles an hour, moving through crossings that are no more than a few hundred feet. So I can appreciate what you're hearing. Uh, I understand it, and that's why we're engaged in this process. But the, I think the answer that you'll find, uh, and may not be satisfying, is that the railroad uh, engineer, if they're doing their job properly, will sound their horn on a routine basis uh, four times 19, uh, 76 times as they go through a few short miles here in Ann Arbor. What that sounds like to a person might be a continuous blast, and, and I appreciate that. Yes. I mean, I've been there for 40 years, and I've learned. Some guys just go, doo, 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 doo. and then other guys, there's, there's a new guy. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you. Come back to the side. I was talking to this gentleman saying, I've been in my house about 19 years now, and I'm less than a block from the Ann Arbor Railroad, right across the trailer, and Pontiac Trailer, and all the Uh, you can hear the horn for miles, even when it's soft. 
so again, I, uh, the comment is related to the, uh, the way the various operators uh, sound the horn as it travels through town. Uh, the one thing that I can say as city staff, uh, I do not control. We do have contact with the railroad. Uh, they, uh, uh, based on their requirements, recite to us uh, what it is that they need to do and that what they're doing is compliant with the requirements. Although they're different, the only thing that we can do as a city to assure you as our uh, community that we're able to uh, uh, address the issue is to move forward with a quiet zone so that the, so the horns aren't sounded by any. Now, the, the issue uh, related to is there a more acceptable sounding pattern, the answer is no one will attest to that, and that's not going to provide you, I believe, the comfort that you're seeking. So uh, I appreciate and applaud the council for authorizing us to uh, pursue this investigation, and maybe uh, in the interim there will be a different rail engineer, and this might uh, become quiet. But, yeah, the, so the range is at 96 to 110. So there is a, a range, and I know sound is logarithmic, exponential, and that 96 and 110 uh, are, is probably a, a huge difference, and that's not my expertise. But what I can say is, even though we're saying over the past few months, I've got a file here that was left uh, by. Uh, uh, prior uh, traffic staff, uh, back in 1995, the city's mayor had appointed a train whistle task force. Similar, there weren't the FRA quiet zone regulations at the time, but I have a complete file that shows of the engineering work that was done, the cost estimation work that was done, the roadways that were recommended to be closed. Uh, some are similar to what we experience today, quite frankly. So. Uh, my sense is the only way that we can grab the bull by the horns, the way that we can assure ourselves that this is not going to be an issue in the future, is to make a decision to advance a quiet zone implementation exercise. In the absence of that, we're at the vagaries of the individual operator. And uh, again, I appreciate everyone coming out this evening. I've received uh, scores of emails, and I appreciate the interest in the community, and we're doing that which we can do in order to advance the way that we could affect how the tr trains operate through our community. In the back. Appreciate the question. Uh, the question is who makes the, the final decision? So uh, in the early phases, it's the technical experts that are making the recommendations. Those recommendations, including the cost estimations, then percolate their way up. At the end of the day, the way that the city of Ann Arbor conducts its business is through an action of the city council. Uh, and so that uh, I, I ran through, there's a lot of work before it gets prepared for council, and we do have council uh, represented here this evening. We will, as staff, obviously keep uh, our leadership uh, informed as we move forward, but I believe the, the, if the decision to proceed is a decision to uh, invest resources in capital improvements, that is uh, approved by council. In the front. Um, we don't, I'm following up a couple of these points. We don't know what the um, difference in the experience of sound is between 90 and 120, between the minimum and the max maximum. And it seems to me that that could be important for this equation of cost, safety, quality of life. I, I have, there are periods in which we have quiet drivers, quiet, you know, I, and I love the railroad. So I said, that's a poet driving the train. But the roads are still safe. I, and, and it seems to me that if the train uh, company accepted that there could be governors on the train, on the horn, that it would be minimum for a year or something like that, we would experience what it would be like at the minimum. And maybe we'd say, Hey, we can live with this. It's safe. Um, the cost, the city or county, state could help with the cost of putting these governors on. So they can't even put the horn at a level above. 
Right. Uh, so uh, again, just to re repeat the question, uh, it's related to being able to uh, control the the volume and, and what is the difference between 96 and 110 and is there something that can be done? This is clearly an area that I'm going to look to my new friends uh, because what they mentioned to me earlier today, and again, my new friends met them today for the first time, um, is that uh, they do other uh, types of sound investigations, and I think that they might be in a very strong position to give you a sense, uh, both from their experience in railroad plus in noise evaluation. Can I just say that they are doing a, a great job in, in pushing this process forward, but it may not be a concern for them that about the minimum sound, because for them, their business model is So uh, let's uh, focus on the issue of the initial question related to the noise uh, volume and whether there's anything that could be done. With regard to a business model, the issue here is that this entire program is responsive to federal regulations. And SRF is only one of uh, several firms that do this work. But the, 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 uh, the, the common denominator is that there are uh, federal regulations and that uh, we, in coordination with MDOT and the FRA, we're out there with uh, our team today. But uh, again, let me just turn to Andy to, or Chris uh, to speak about the amplitude of the sound. So I'll answer the technical part first. Um, you know, it's been mentioned that the, the 96 decibels to 110 decibel range, it's a logarithmic scale. Um, every 10, you double in intensity. So that difference between 96 and 110 is approximately two and a half times the intensity level. Now, so that, that is a, pr a pretty big difference. The issue, however, we actually did raise this question with the railroad when we were out in the field at the diagnostic today. You know, we just posed the question, you know, given that there is this range, is there any availability to kind of taper it down a little bit to, to quiet it? And the answer we got, and the answer that I think any railroad will give you, is that they really view this through the lens of liability to them. If they're given a range, they don't want to go too low. They don't want to be in the low end of that range, because if there is a collision, and they were found to have been blowing at 95 decibels, then they are significantly liable in that sort of instance. So they will always err towards the side of the higher end. So I think, unfortunately, the answer from the railroad is that you know, they might, they might squeak a little bit, uh, you know, not be totally at 110, maybe 105, but they're going to be in the upper range. That's, it's in their, their best interest for their operations and their overall liability position. So to repeat the question, it is um, essentially a question of, of phasing. Is there, in our experience, have we encountered um, corridors where instead of doing the entire corridor all, all at once, we chunk it off into you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, and so on? And the answer is yes, we have uh, taken that approach in a number of different cities. Um, quite often, you know, we have a corridor. Um, I, I know, you know th this, this corridor in particular ranges from, um, you know, busier areas down to the south to very, you know, to very high intensity uh, downtown activity to more quiet residential activity on the north. So there are different levels of impact uh, to different people, denser populations, less dense populations. In this instance, we essentially need a quarter mile break uh, from the last quiet zone crossing to the next non-quiet zone crossing. And there are some, you know, I'll say natural breaks in this corridor between Liberty and Summit, and then between Summit and I believe it's Wright is the next one to the north. Um, so th there is potential to maybe look at, maybe we look at just a downtown uh, only focus quiet zone where we look at Liberty down to Hoover or Liberty down to State, and maybe we look at a separate quiet zone that is only the, the northern um, crossings, or maybe Summit is its own 
crossing. And part of our role here will be to look at those different options. We'll have a scenario that looks at, here's the entire corridor as a whole, here's the costs and the benefits. And then if you want to phase it as you know, funding becomes available, here's how you could do it in stages to focus only on, on these smaller sections one at a time. Is there any entity, whether state or federal, to which the uh, Watco Railroad Company is accountable in terms of uh, entities that might monitor occasionally, you know, evaluate to the, the degree to which they are uh, uh, obeying the rules or maybe possibly exceeding them? Mm -hmm. So, what are the ramifications of that? So, they, they are primarily regulated by the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, I believe Chris Kfundel could speak more to MDOT's um, role in that, but the FRA does run um, routine inspections of each railroad system, both you know, the track uh, itself and also their operations. Uh, I, I don't know the specifics of the, um, you know, the punitive measures, but um, I, the FRA is the primary um, regulating agency. So the question is, the, the range is 96 to 110 decibels. Are they staying within that range? Are they above it? And it's a difficult question to answer because sound is a very misbehaving uh, physical force. You know, the, they measure, uh, there are strict requirements for how that volume is measured. I believe it's, you know, it's a set distance from the rail horn, it's a set height, and that's where they actually do the measurement. But when you get into an urban area, um, where you have buildings, where the sound is ricocheting and is, is propagating in different ways than is normal. It, it could, in some instances, be above that 110, but it is not exceeding the, the rule because, based on the testing standard, it is within the range. Maybe just to add upon that, the, there are strict requirements for sounding the horn, uh, for not sounding the horn, they can be fined and ticketed, you know, but so many violations and they'll be fired essentially. Uh, so the routine sounding of horns, how they sound it, and the degree to which they sound it is of significance matter to them. Um, safety is, is their of utmost importance. To Chris's, to Chris's comment about, you know, the, the sound ranges, they have to be within that 96 to 110 range per FRA requirements. If they were to come out at a random inspection and be at 112 or be at 95, they would be facing significant penalties as well for doing that. So their, their system keeps them on that upper range, as Chris had mentioned, you know, near the 110 level for safety purposes, and, and essentially that's it. So. So, so there, there's objectivity in the in the, the decibel level of the horn. There is some some I, I hear you loud and clear. There is some minor subjectivity in terms of how Chris and I would both sound the horn. You know, he he might give it as as someone indicated earlier, very short. The the regulation is two shorts, a long, and a short. And that long is as the train approaches the crossing, it sounds it all the way through the through the crossing, and then a short to follow. That two shorts, long and a short, is somewhat subjective in terms of how long, what constitutes a short, what constitutes a long. Um, that is up to the, the railroad operations. I, I hear your point there. Um, to, to that regard, though, it is the railroad's responsibility to train and administer and, and continue to monitor that, that horn sounding and things. And, and if there are complaints, whether it be through the Michigan Department of Transportation, the FRA, what have you, um, they follow up with them to ensure that they are compliant within that standard. Yes, ma'am. So 
So the question was, will the public have uh, access to the recommendations report? And the simple answer is yes. Uh, I'm not sure when it's in the format that we're going to be able to um, share the information, whether it's, uh, and, and again, please sign in, leave us your email, and if you're on the email list, you'll absolutely get notification of when the information. For those of you who are at home, uh, my email address is ecooper at a2gov.org. Uh, please send me an email uh, if you're interested in receiving the information, and we'll make sure that you receive subsequent notices. Uh, but it, it sounds like within a couple, three months, we'll be receiving the recommendations. And so that would be a time frame we're uh, probably looking at um, November, December, uh, maybe the beginning of next year, where we'll engage with the Transportation Commission and other uh, public bodies within the city, uh, depending on uh, how complex uh, the recommendations are and how much work we need to get our minds around it. and. Uh, synthesize it in a way that we can share it with the public. Hearing a lot of things in terms of different uh, alternative safety measures, different implementation strategies, and uh, although we're not going to have it, if you will, in a refined and final fashion, uh, we want to at least make sure that if we present it or as we present it uh, to the public that it's in a fashion that uh, you're able to engage with us in meaningful dialogue. So uh, the question, as I understand it, you're asking is the sounding of the horn because there are, uh, and I'll, maybe I'll, 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 I'll put a, an additional word on it, homeless people that are resident along the railroad corridor. And so again, I think that uh, what we're hearing about with regard to the routine sounding, the answer to that is no, there's a particular pattern. Uh, but that there are uh, discretionary uh, calls made by the engineer if they witness what they see is a hazardous situation. Uh, so uh, again, I'm not in the uh, engineer's position uh, and I'm not familiar with any residences, uh, illegal or otherwise, uh, but that, uh, you know, that would be something that we could check with the railroad itself to see if that uh, explains any behaviors that, uh, that, that they're uh, willing to describe or discuss with us. Because if, in fact, that is the case, then there uh, may be things that could be done in terms of assuring that uh, folks have a more appropriate place for uh, housing and for uh, moving about the community. Please. Well, I mean, to, to be completely honest, and I think in both of our experience, that, that question has never uh, been raised. Uh, I guess uh, to repeat the question, the question is the uh, environmental um, noise, sorry, what was it? The EPA Noise Control Act. Uh, has that ever been raised in consideration of the, uh, the railroad sending their horns? And uh, I, I don't know enough about that regulation to uh, know exactly how it intertwines with the FRA train horn rule, but um, all I can say is that I do know that the train horn rule is what the railroads are using as their primary guidance in this case. So the, the question is on what, why isn't there current technology to make this more of a standard thing? I, I do want to add and, and clarify a bit to Andy's previous answer. Um, 
the decibel level of the train horn itself, as explained to us today by the railroad, is set. It is locked in after they do that test. So the engineer does not have control of the actual decibel level. What they do have control of is that duration. And in, unfortunately, you know, there are, when you're driving in your, your car, there's different uses for your horn. If you're about to, uh, to run into somebody, that's when you lay on the horn. If you just want to give a little tap to notify somebody that, you know, light's green now, you know, there's different uses for the horn. And it, it is in the interest of public safety that the engineer has full use of the horn to use as they see fit. It's just there is that subjectivity that co comes into play with each engineer and you know, we don't know the exact conditions that they're operating under what they're seeing from the engineering cab, if there's a reason that they're sounding it. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, you want to address train speed and the advanced quarter mile, 20 second? Yeah, so the, the rule also states that um, you need to, the, the engineer, the train start, needs to start sounding their horn uh, 20 seconds before they get to the crossing um, at a 5 to 10 mile speed. I, I don't recall exactly how far in advance that is. It's, it's, in the matter of hundreds of feet. Um, so that, that is the other part of the rule that they should be adhering to. There's, uh, you know, a, the issue when you have, especially in downtown, so many crossings that are spaced so close together, you know, they may be, you know, when they're supposed to be sounding the horn for the next crossing, uh, they may be still sounding the horn for the crossing that they're about to go through, which is part of the reason that an engineer may just hold down the horn while they go through in their minds, it covers all their bases. I didn't do anything wrong. I made sure I sounded the horn. Again, it's remarkable that it's not audio. Mm -hmm. But wait, so if it's set at one decibel level, then why is there a range? Yeah. Why, why is there a allowable range? Yeah. What's it set at? What is it set at? Like I, 96? <laughs> or 120? I don't know exactly what Ann Arbor Railroad's okay. decibel level is set at. I mean, that, that's something we can ask the railroad to, uh, to see if they can. Somehow this all just, it just seems this whole quiet zone, the whole study, the whole, you know, changing the intersections, and uh, it's all, it just seems like a huge expense and a giant project for what seems like a fairly common sense, simple solution. Uh, you know, on the other hand, it, it, it expenses. Mm -hmm. One, one thing I'll say is that... So in 1994, when Congress allowed quiet zones to, to occur, they, they went in about 11 years from 1994 to 2005 to really solicit input and get comments. And that was from the railroads, it was from DOTs, it was from other experts and things. Um, communities to, to try to gauge and evaluate what is the right thing to do for safety. And part of it is that, that range allows for some flexibility, railroad to railroad, um, how they operate. But they, they taking 11 years to really study something and the comprehensive nature of the rule, which in my opinion is a very, very thorough and complete process, um, the amount of work that went into developing that is, is quite significant in terms of nationwide, all the different rail scenarios and crossings and things like that. But it, that 11 years was spent to really try to investigate this and, and how to really regulate this, this horn sounding. I know, it, I know it may seem and appear to be you know, so simple as you know, have a button, there's an app for that, right? As the saying goes, um, unfortunately when it comes to public safety and, and the regulation of railroads, um, it, it, it just gets very complicated and complex quickly, so. Following up on that common sense, in your experience with the 16 years or so, have you ever had the experience where the railroad ultimately will say, you know what, instead of spending millions of dollars, we just won't run our train between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m.? <laughs> The, the, the question is essentially um, limiting their hours of service uh, based on time of day. And I, I, I don't work for a railroad, um, never have, 
but you know they're in the business of moving freight and they're on very set schedules uh, based on track operations and things to to run those and so uh, while they may try I'm sure if you gave a locomotive engineer the choice he or she would probably choose to work during the day than at night uh, maybe maybe not but uh, you know they, they move freight when freight needs to be moved essentially the one thing I'll say is that there is a choice and one thing that we didn't mention in our presentation is that some communities have chose to go with a nighttime only quiet zone and maybe to address your point um, you could have the choice of, of implementing a quiet zone between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m., for instance, to just silence horns through that nighttime only regulation. Keep them during the day, um, but then when the majority of the community is sleeping and resting, they would, they would cease they the routine. Yeah, you, uh, agreed. I'm not, I'm not saying it would. I'm just saying that that's an option in there to address that nighttime only condition. Yes, sir. I assume the problem is that the Ann Arbor Railroad chooses to ship at night and they blow their horns. And I'll go out on them and say, if you survey people, most people would say, we don't want the horns at night. Will the solution eliminate horns sounding at night? The, the, implement, the question is, would the, would the quiet zone eliminate the sounding of horns at night? Uh, the answer to that question is, the implementation of a quiet zone would cease the routine sounding of horns at night. You know, as mentioned earlier, you know, there may be some switching movements that, that the horn may, would be sounded at. If there is construction going on, say there's nighttime roadway work that's going on, they would sound at, 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 at that crossing. We, we haven't discussed that yet. Um, that'll certainly be something that we will um, discuss and, and evaluate as we move forward and look for input from, from the community for that. Yep, certainly. Sir, did you have a question? So the, the, the question is, does uh, potential nighttime only quiet zone change any of the risk calculations that we'll undertake for this quiet zone? And the, the short answer is um, it really does not. The risk calculations work the same for a 24-hour zone, same as they do for a nighttime only quiet zone. And that's <coughs> excuse me, part of the reason that uh, you know, the, the topic of a nighttime only quiet zone often doesn't even come up is because you have to meet the same requirements that you would for a 24-hour quiet zone. So for most communities, you know, if you're going through that trouble of si silencing the horns at night, you might as well do it for the 24-hour period. Uh, it's always an option to do it nighttime only. We do actually have a quiet zone um, a few miles from our office that is uh, nighttime only. But it does not change any of the risk calculations that we would perform. And maybe to add, that is the only one that, that we've worked on that is a nighttime only. It is very rare. Uh, it's a, a near a recreational area, a lake and things with a lot of uh, visitors that aren't local to the area at times. And so that's why they preferred to go with a nighttime only, but keep the horns during the day. They have only got a, a, a select number of crossings. There's not a lot there. So it wasn't as impactful as what it might be here, but that's the only one that, that we've worked on. So. So the, to read the question, is there um, a perspective of any downside um, or uh, consequences uh, of uh, implementing? So uh, the, the idea of uh, being a planner and planning and engaging input, there's a consequence that
but not everybody's going to get everything that they want, so that might be one of the outcomes that some folks may not be satisfied regardless of how far we go or don't go uh, with pursuing this. Uh, clearly, uh, when you look at the triangle, uh, the issue of safety, I think that um, there's a certain level of safety that's afforded by the horns. Uh, the metrics will show us what the post uh, quiet zone install would look like, and I think that we'll be able to address the safety. Uh, but the other side of the triangle is cost, and I heard the reference to millions, and that's orders of magnitude uh, what we're talking about. This, these are not inexpensive uh, investments in order to create the environment that assures the safety, uh, provides the quality of life. So again, a consequence of that is some folks may not see that as the highest and best use of public uh, resources. Those are the general ones that as staff I feel comfortable. Uh, I know that you've addressed the council member and I don't know uh, council member. A at this point, well, let's uh, leave it at that. And, um, you know, uh, again, uh, one of the things that we will continue to do is to be um, uh, participatory, transparent, and we look forward to uh, receiving the recommendations from the team and working through the community with that uh, in order to uh, frame the best set of recommendations that we can consider as a community. Additional questions? Sure, go right ahead. Yeah, certainly. So just to repeat the question for, for everybody's sake, um, have we had any follow-up um, analysis, uh, feedback, what have you, from many of the communities that we've worked with in terms of economic development impacts from implementing a quiet zone, essentially, is, is the question. Property, Property values, yes. And, and the answer to that is... Um, is a little complex. You know, it's hard to evaluate property values here in 2018 and what they might be in 2025, just given inflation and other growth and development. However, I will say that we have worked with a number of communities that have um, implemented a quiet zone and pursued a quiet zone for economic development purposes, and whether that be for um, downtown residential um, housing, whether it be for commercial businesses. You know, developers are, are savvy and, and intellectual folks who, um, if there's a deterrent for people coming to an area, um, property values will go down. And so if, if you can make improvements to enhance that, you know, look at, look at the growth and, and things that are going on around town today, um, property values will go up. I don't have a set number for you. Some do. I remember. Oh, all right. Go. <laughs> Okay, just general, sure. Maybe just to reiterate what, what she said, uh, a 20% difference between being next to the railroad tracks and being a couple of blocks away from the railroad tracks. And if it were to be quieted, uh, one would hope and expect that you could see potentially a 20% increase in your property value. Yes, ma'am.
the community about whether the quality of life improved? Yeah, certainly, and the question has to do with any uh, follow-up studies, analysis, feedback, what have you, from communities in terms of increasing the quality of life. Um, the city of Fargo, North Dakota, uh, was one of our, our early uh, quiet zones that we'd worked on. This is one of the longest and most complex quiet zones in the country. Um, between Fargo and Moorhead, the two cities there, they've got 21 crossings, I believe. Um, the city of Fargo in, in, I think it was 2008, uh, won a, an international downtown um, community award essentially for the implementation of the quiet zone, what that did for both quality of life as well as economic development. They saw a tremendous increase in downtown redevelopment with not only um, residential properties but also just commercial businesses, office buildings and otherwise that were, were coming to town. Because of that, um, I can cite the city of Burlington, Iowa as another example that had a number of downtown crossings that once the quiet zone was implemented, um, it was a, what I'll maybe call a, a somewhat struggling downtown when, when the quiet zone, before the quiet zone. After the quiet zone was implemented, uh, they saw quite an increase and in a, in a spark in residential growth as well as then uh, restaurants and other types of entertainment activities. I, I can't put my finger on that it was, you know, a one for one because of this, that. I, I'm not saying that. I don't want to mislead you. No, th I, we, 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 don't, uh, we don't go as far as doing economic impact analysis and things. Um, that's outside of what, what our company does. Um, but I'm sure somebody could. I'm, there probably is a, a case study out there or some sorts, uh, maybe a grad student or something like that that um, uh, could do some analysis on that. So thank you. Yes, sir. Um, another question. It sounds like if this were to proceed, it very well may overlap with work on potential work on the Tree Line Trail. Is there any discussion with Blanco and the other railroads about how this might dovetail? So, so. Uh, the question uh, involves uh, whether the uh, Allen Creek Tree Line Urban Trail has been taken into consideration as we begin to look at the quiet zone. And so as uh, one of the city staff who was along on the diagnostic tour, uh, starting I think it was when we were on, on Hoover. Uh, I know that that's one of the uh, interim measures for the tree line and I, that was the first and the first of many times that I raised the issue of we need to make sure that uh, the tree line and the elements of that are integrated into this decision making process. I would also add that as we were looking at uh, First and Ashley, uh, again the conditions out there today are one way. Uh, there's a project underway for two way and so that in the diagnostic we looked at what would be necessary in the two way conversion scenario. So I appreciate the question and uh, to the extent that things that we are working on and we're aware of were explored and it will be integrated in uh, to the work that's coming forward. I want to circle back to the economic impact uh, question again. Chris just reminded me, uh, we did work with uh, another community in Texas that had a situation that was somewhat pivotal on, on the quiet zone being implemented and the developer actually helped to pony up some of the money for the study and implementation because the development that they were proposing would not have moved forward without the quiet zone being in place. So again, not quantifiable, but just in terms of impact um, and, and what it can do for a community. So just wanted to state that as well as another example. Okay, as, as I look around, uh, I see people looking and I don't see hands going up, so I think unless anyone has a last question, uh, I, although the meeting was uh, called uh, at 7 and that we have the room until 9, I uh, take one more opportunity to thank each of you for spending your time here this evening. Uh, again, please sign in. We do have uh, comment forms. To, if you have any comments that you'd like to leave for, uh, for us uh, as the project team, and thank you, and get home safely. Thank you. Thanks, Eli. Thank you. Thanks, guys.